and thank you for joining us for another episode of Matters of the Heart, brought to you by Pentucket Medical Cardiology and Haverhill Community Television. My name is Dr. Sonny Srivastava, and I'm joined once again today by one of my colleagues, Dr. Seth Bilazarian, and we're here to talk about something that I think both of us find very exciting, uh, as we have been waiting to hear about this for quite some time, uh, and actually it's very timely because it was just yesterday uh, when we have new guidelines on how to handle cholesterol uh, in the general population. It's been quite some time since we had um, new guidelines published, so this is very exciting for us. Uh, and so maybe I will uh, turn this over to Dr. Bill Azir, and he can tell us a little bit about when it was last we had guidelines and why we're so excited about something new now. Great. So as you said, so uh, November 12th at 4 o'clock was the official release of the uh, data of uh, new guidelines. So we have four new guidelines, which we'll talk about. Uh, the guidelines for cholesterol were actually last written in 2001, quite a long time ago. They were called the ATP, the Adult Treatment Plan or Program. Uh, that was number three in 2001, and we've been waiting now for a long time because we've had a lot of the studies and clinical data for cholesterol and how to treat patients with cholesterol that have come out in the last few years, but we haven't had any sort of update. Just briefly to step back a minute, there are studies in which patients are put into a trial. Oftentimes these are called control trials where half of the patients get a medicine and half get another drug or a placebo and they're compared. That's called a study or a trial. But then when you get all these different trials, you try to make sense of it, and you and I as physicians want to do the best for our patients, but we rely on expert consensus guidelines, is what they're called, where a group of experts in cholesterol, experts in blood pressure, look at all the data and come up with recommendations for new ways we should treat patients. So that's what this is. This is a guideline. So the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association, the two biggest heart organizations in the United States, got together and released these new guidelines. Previously, the guidelines were put out by the government, by part of the National Institutes of Health, called the NHLBI, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, has done these guidelines in the past for us. But from 2001 until this year, they, we've been waiting and they haven't delivered, and they finally said, well, we're not gonna do this, and they turned it over to the ACC and AHA about six months ago. So it's actually quite an achievement that in six months the, the ACC and AHA put these new guidelines out, which we really did need because we do have a lot of questions. These guidelines are always consensus, meaning that a group of very smart people sit around a table and hash it out and discuss it and try to come up with it, but it's not new data, it's just how should we use the data that we have. So there's also a fair number of people who have already come out and said that they don't agree with the consensus right. guidelines. So today, two physicians, one from Harvard Medical School and one from Stanford wrote in the New York Times why the guidelines are flawed and why we shouldn't follow them. So, so there's plenty of room for discussion, but it's actually valuable to have this as a point to at least begin discussing. So uh, the guidelines at ATP3, which was the previous guidelines from 2001, basically gave us target LDL goals. And LDL, people in our audience know very well because we've talked about this many times. LDL is sometimes called the bad cholesterol. It stands for low density lipoprotein. But LDL goal gave us a, a series of goals to try to achieve. So if a patient had problems with their heart or had a prior stroke or had some vascular problem, the LDL goal was 70. If they basically are a patient who couldn't achieve 70 but they had secondary prevention, it was strongly recommended to be at least 100. But for everyone else, most people it's recommended to be an LDL goal less than 130. So it was a goal-oriented guideline. So that's the way the LDL treatment guidelines worked in the past from the ATP3. There are some changes from that, and we're going to talk about those, those in a second. But for me, as a citizen, taxpayer, cardiologist, it is kind of disappointing. I just would say from an editorial standpoint, I'll just say that, that it took from 2001 to 2013 for the NHLBI to say, well, we're not going to do this. They could have done this three or five years right. ago so that we could have had some updated guidelines. Because for you and I as practicing physicians, and I think we both try to do a good job. I mean, we could always do better, but we try to read the journal articles. We try to make decisions. We talk about them. We present them in our own practice and in, in a group form at lunch every Thursday our practice has a lunchtime forum where we review different new information to try to make best sense of it but it is nice to have a sort of talking point a guideline like this puts a stake in the ground so to speak so people say this is what they're recommending we can now criticize it and maybe it'll be changed again in a few years but it's really valuable to have these kinds of consensus guidelines any thought about that no I agree wholeheartedly um, that it's a invaluable tool to have when sitting down discussing patients and it's um, 
But it's not foolproof, it's just evidenced by the fact that today, very prominent folks are coming out railing against the guidelines, uh, and they're just that, they're guidelines, they're right. meant to give you guidance, it's right. not going to be hard and true and fast in every single patient, um, sure. and so it's useful. But um, and what are the guidelines based on? I know they are looking at a lot of different research studies. How, what do we have from 2001 to 2013? Well, we have a lot of data. So there's a lot of trials with the statin class of medications. The statin medications are the medicines that are, people have heard about, Lipitor, Atorvastatin, Crestor, Resuvastatin, Simvastatin used to be called Zocor, Pravastatin, Lovastatin. Uh, these are all statins. They're all f in their name with the word statin. So that's why they're called statin medications. So we have a lot of data about that that has helped guide us in terms of that using a, a, getting some patients with lower levels of cholesterol or using these stronger medicines is more valuable if someone has serious problems with their heart or had a prior stroke. So, so we're talking about data on, would you say, hundreds of thousands of people? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, and then there's non-statin trials as right. well. Right. So now we also, you and I have participated <clears throat> in some studies of other cholesterol medicines like the medicine niacin, which we've talked about about. I used to be an enthusiast for that medicine because it did some good things to the cholesterol numbers. It lowers the LDL, it raises the good cholesterol, it lowers triglyceride. But in a study that we participated in that was sponsored by National Institutes of Health right here in the United States, it showed it was of absolutely no value in preventing strokes or heart attacks. Uh, and then a second study was done that was even larger in Europe which showed the same thing. So that's an example of how we've been waiting that it's pretty clear we shouldn't use that, but having a strong statement that says, look, this data shows that this is not an effective medicine, we shouldn't use it, would be very valuable. Again, as a taxpayer, I have some concern because the niacin sales are still over $2 billion. So it's a medicine, really it's amazing. Wow. It's amazing that that that's, uh, drug has no efficacy, it doesn't prevent strokes and heart attacks. Talk about wasting money. You know, doctors are talk, criticized for wasting money. Uh, this is something that we should really stop doing. We should stop wasting money on niacin as an example. Another class of medicines called fibrates are also been shown to be of no value in preventing strokes or heart attacks, but they still get a lot of use, and they're over $2 billion as well. A drug called phenofibrate uh, is a medicine, or Tricor used to be called, is a medicine that has over $2 billion in sales. So it's uh, really... Um, Guidelines, I think, are helpful, and these guidelines are just skipped to the end and say the guidelines did say that, that we shouldn't be using those drugs because they don't have the good effect on heart attack and stroke reduction. So what we got on, uh, as I mentioned uh, two days ago on, on November 12th, was uh, four sets of guidelines, and we're going to focus mostly on cholesterol, but I'll mention briefly the other ones. One guideline is on cholesterol. One is on risk management. How do you assess a patient? And that's used for patients who don't already have a heart attack or stroke. One thing the guidelines didn't do is they said if you've had a heart attack or stroke, you're considered secondary prevention, meaning that you already had a problem, we want to prevent another, another uh, heart attack or stroke. You should be treated with cholesterol medicine. And even those people who criticize the guidelines today in the New York Times, uh, a, 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 a rather renowned cardiologist named Rita Redberg, who is the editor of one of our journals called JAMA Internal Medicine, who's very prominent in speaking out against things that aren't effective. She actually writes an article in this journal called Less is More. She was one of the authors of this New York Times article this morning. And she specifically accepted or, or removed from the discussion secondary prevention. So even those people who think we should be cautious in using cholesterol medicines, all those people agree we should be using it in patients with secondary prevention. So we're not talking that about that at all. But one of the, the second guidelines is risk assessment. So if you're a person who hasn't had a heart attack or stroke, figuring out how high your risk is a second of the four guidelines. A third guideline is on obesity. We've talked about that, overweight, how, how should we manage these patients? And a fourth one is one of your favorites, lifestyle recommendations. <laughs> so uh, about exercise, diet, uh, those kinds of things. So I'm gonna focus mostly on cholesterol risk management. I'll mention briefly obesity and not mention lifestyle very much in the limited time we have. But just to go ahead and, and talk a little bit about, about some of the things. So as I mentioned, you know, I don't think there's any questions about these non-statin medicines. We shouldn't be using them, in my opinion. Other people may have questions, so, but there are a variety of other questions, like how should we evaluate people? There's a bunch of, of, uh, of enthusiasts for some different kind of ways to figure out if someone is at high risk. 
One of the things we've talked about in, in, on our show is a marker of inflammation called CRP, or C-reactive protein. How should that be used, or should it be used? Some people have talked about trying to figure out what someone has blockages early by using CAT scans or something called coronary calcium with a CAT scan or measuring the carotid artery thickness or measuring circulation problems from a blood test called, from a test called the ankle brachial index or ABI. These are some different ways that people have, have, are, are, have advocated for figuring out someone is of high or low risk. So those are some of the questions that I've had that, that are addressed to some extent in this. One of the other questions that's come up is there are different risk factors for different sexes and different races. So this, ha this has attempted to evaluate that by breaking out races. So uh, uh, the racial groups white and African American are separated in the risk assessment, and men and women are separated in the risk assessment. So there's some, there are some things that have, that, that, that have moved forward, but a variety of things have not been answered. And actually some of the questions have actually been heightened for me by this. Mm -hmm. One of the areas that's interesting is that this guideline said that we shouldn't be using these cholesterol medicines to people who have congestive heart failure. Did it, so it said that or so we don't know still? Nope, it says, it, it says no recommendation actually, okay. but it says that it should not be used in the appendix at the end of the guidelines where they specifically say that there are recommendations. They say there's no, th there's no current recommendation for use of it, so therefore we have to not use it is basically what it says. But what do we do? And as a, as a reader of this, if someone has had a heart attack, they are recommended for statin therapy, but if they have a heart attack and congestive heart failure, which one should we do? So these are some of the things that, that the guidelines, I think, have left kind of difficult for, for someone even as expert as I will. I'll hopefully be modest, but say that somebody who, who has an expertise in this, hard to interpret. So moving on, there's a variety of questions, and, and there are uh, some other issues that are, are left out there. But, but just to move ahead, I would say that um, I'm very happy to say that, that, the, um, that the societies that you and I belong to, American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology, have pretty quickly in six months turned this around. We were supposed to also get an update on the blood pressure guidelines. Mm -hmm. The blood pressure guidelines are called the JNC guidelines, the Joint National Commission, and they're up to number seven, and we're supposed to get number eight yesterday, but they didn't give us that. So we only got these four guidelines that I mentioned, cholesterol, obesity, risk assessment, and lifestyle issues. So that's where we are. And um, they, the, uh, the thing that, that has happened is that these guidelines have changed. They're trying to do them slightly differently. There used to be an enormous document of several thousand pages of all of the data with interpretation. They've tried to be more succinct, more limited to answer specific questions and answer specific questions. And intentionally, are, they're gonna leave some questions unanswered. That, that's, that's something that was said in the press release for these guidelines. Um, and they have retained something that we've seen in our guidelines. In our guidelines, we have um, a series of recommendations, uh, recommendations one, two, and three, and then after the one or two, they have an A or a B. So recommendation one is it's strongly recommended. You should definitely be doing this. Number two is probably recommended, and the A is there's good evidence, and B is there's not so good evidence, and then number three is you definitely should not do this. So they've retained that same kind of guidelines uh, recommendations. So um, moving forward, uh, let me just go off the cholesterol briefly just to say some things about obesity. You and I have covered obesity previously, but the guidelines <coughs> from yesterday said uh, a few things about obesity. Um, it answers some questions about obesity, and it, it really sort of hammers home the importance of using two measures of obesity, one called the body mass index, which is something that anybody can figure out on the internet or somewhere else, a calculator. Just your height and your weight comes up with a body mass index. So that's one. And the second criteria is something that they've, we've talked about a lot, but now again, part of the guidelines makes it more solid. We should actually measure people's waist because the waist circumference is a valuable predictor of obesity-related complications like diabetes and other risk factors. A second thing is, you know, we know that more weight loss is better, but how much is better? And after the review of the, of the literature by these experts, they say that as little as 3 to 5% of the patient's body weight can be valuable for reducing risk of diabetes, blood pressure, and cholesterol. So, you know, if someone is... So if you're a 200-pounder... Or if you're 200 pounds and you're... Losing and 6 you're, pounds. If you're, say, you know, 20 pounds overweight, losing 6 pounds would be valuable. You know, it depends yeah. how much, but that, yeah. that's the idea. Wow. So... Uh, and I, I, you know, I think you know, they clearly made the point that more would be better, but right. I think the idea is to encourage people to at least begin the process by losing some. So I think that's the idea. And then 
uh, what are the best diets was also addressed. And they basically came down to say that the two diets that seem to be best are two that we've discussed here, the Mediterranean style diet and the DASH diet. Um, and then um, they talked a little bit about lifestyle intervention and they recommended something that you and I know would be valuable. Uh, and that would be that we should have patients who really have these important risk factors like obesity and other related problems be in a program where they would get counseling. They would actually be able to meet with a counselor, get recommendation on nutrition, have oversight and be taught about diet classes, exercise classes. But the problem is this is just not covered by our insurers. So hopefully one thing that could come of this is that the guidelines will then allow us to push insurers to say, look, we have these patients who are overweight. You, insurance company, need to cover this as a valuable tool to help with obesity. And then the last thing is that they did firm up a recommendation for a kind of uh, treatment for uh, patients who are obese called bariatric surgery or weight loss surgery, or some people call stomach sta stapling or gastric bypass. These different surgeries um, we know can help people with weight loss. They do seem to give persistent weight loss, but they have recommended it in these guidelines for patients who have a body mass index over 30 with several risk factors or a body mass index over 40. So those are some, some guidelines that came out in the obesity guidelines. Any thought about those? No, I think it's nice that they address it first and foremost, um, but I don't think I have any, I haven't had time to digest it all, but I don't think I have any thoughts about um, had a nitpick at that. Okay. Um, it's, it seems to be pretty consistent with what you and I have yeah. talked about previously, what we've covered on our prior show. So I don't think there's anything new there. I just think it right. sort of firms up what it is. And I've, correct me if I'm wrong, this is the first time they've really ever had a, a guideline on the matter. I believe it is, yeah. yes. So, and they specifically did not cover any obesity-related drugs. There are several drugs on the market now. Uh, they basically said that, that we don't have any data to give any kind of recommendation on that. So that's the, that's the obesity guidelines. So now, just going back to the cholesterol guidelines where I'll spend most of my time, um, they basically said that there are four patient groups should, who should get statin therapy. So these four groups are patients who have had a history of heart disease or stroke, that's the secondary prevention patients that, that I mentioned. A second group is patients who have a very high level of the LDL, an LDL level, level over 190. These patients awful, often have an inherited kind of cholesterol problem called familial hypercholesterolemia, or FH. So that's a second group who should get statin therapy. A third group of patients who uh, are patients who have diabetes and have an elevated LDL, if they have a high risk based on an evaluation with a risk factor greater than 7.5%. And they put an age in there as well, right. between ages of 40 and 70, that's new. That's that new, yeah, new, that so. is new. And the final thing is they should, we should assess patients' 10-year global risk for, for heart disease. So there's a calculator that they've given us. We can plug in all the numbers, and if their risk is over 7.5%, those patients should get statin therapy, but the, 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 but the calculator only works for age four, over age 40. So basically they have left us wide open what to do with people under age 40, implying we should not be treating them. So if you have a patient, as I did today, whose both parents had heart disease in their early 40s, who comes with some concern and has high cholesterol, when I did this, I did this with him today, the calculator said, can't do it, you're not 40. But you could still, under the age of 40, qualify based on group number one, having had a heart attack or right, stroke, right, group that, number two, right. LDL greater than 190. Right, but if you don't have those two, so this patient didn't have, this patient had a high LDL, 160, has family history, but these guidelines don't take into account family history. That's not part of the calculator. Right. So it's just, you know, we're, we're feeling our way through this. Right. What's interesting is the prior calculator that we used in the prior guidelines was something called the Framingham Risk Score or calculator. And many people have seen this. It's available on the internet. It's available on our phones. Uh, it's easy to use, but you and I have sort of a feeling how to use it now. We can almost guess where the patient's going to fall out based on that, but this is a brand new calculator, so we're going to have to work with it on a lot of patients to sort of get feeling for who is going to be over that 7.5%. And that first group you mentioned, the prior heart attack or stroke, um, is it also including folks who have had revascularization of their legs or that peripheral no, vascular disease? No, it does not mention that. Or carotid disease? No, it does not mention that. So it's a good so point. So we have to... Just do what we think is right, basically. Well, of course, and yeah. For me, I think I would lump those people in that group. I agree with you completely. Um, so I agree okay. with you completely. 
So the cardiovascular mm. risk calculator is available on the internet. Uh, you can go to the American Heart Association, Google American Heart Association cardiovascular risk calculator. And it's a calculator that comes up as a spreadsheet that you can then enter data. And we assume that pretty soon we'll be getting the handheld calculators for our smartphone as an app or some other kind of strategy to be able to, to be uh, easy to just enter the data. But the data just includes some basic things that we all know. It includes age, sex, male or female. I mentioned what's new is race, so they basically have African American or white. They would like to have other Asia, Asian, other uh, ethnic or racial groups on the um, release of the data. They had a press conference and said that they would like to develop uh, Hispanic American and Asian American risk categories, but they don't have that. Uh, so the other things that are included are total cholesterol and HDL. And what I want to just bring to people's attention is uh, when I listened to the call of the release of the data, they had many uh, uh, journalists from nationally renowned papers, Wall Street Journal, New York Times were on the call, and several questions came up, why is the LDL not part of the calculator? And you and I know that if you have the cholesterol and the HDL, it's a way to calculate what's called non-HDL cholesterol or LDL. So it really is an LDL uh, 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 utilizing risk factor by using cholesterol and HDL. The other parts of the parameters are blood pressure, and then the last parts of it, are you on treatment for blood pressure, do you have diabetes, and are you a smoker? So basically there's this calculator, you enter yes, no for those last three, you put in your numbers for all those things, and then you come up with a score. And it comes up with two scores, basically, your 10-year risk and your lifetime risk. And this, this calculator is different because our Framingham score was only for heart attack. This is for heart attack and stroke. So the, the, a couple different things have happened. So what happened is, and I did this for myself, and I came up with a pretty low risk factor because I have optimal cholesterol, optimal blood pressure, I'm not a diabetic, I don't smoke, and uh, I came up with a very low risk factor, but at age 53, my lifetime risk is still high at 36%. So it immediately made me wonder, at 53, if I have a 10-year risk, which is only 5%, that's great, so that means I have only a half a percent a year or, or a one in 200 risk of a heart attack for the next 10 years, but I have a 36% chance of a heart attack over the next, presumably I'll live hopefully 25 more years. Should I be on statin at some point or do you just keep redoing this every five years? That's sort of what's been recommended every four to six years it's reassessed. Any thoughts about that? Um, the reassessing of it every four to six years, I guess, is that too long of a gap? And you know, things change quite a bit in the course of a year or two, and it, it seems like just a subtle change, and I have to play with the, the calculator, but a subtle change in blood pressure, or uh, if your cholesterol profile changes, it can shift your risk for the 10 year period quite a bit. Right, well I guess from a patient standpoint, we would, what we would want to say you know, to our patients, if you, know, if, you know, if you tell a patient we can reassess in two to four years, then we might want to say, uh, you should definitely um, come back sooner if you gain a lot of weight or something else is different. But, yeah. uh, but beyond that, I, I, I'm not I sure. I imagine it's, it's also during your annual physical with your primary care physician, a very simple one-minute exercise to do. Right. And if you're there once a year for your annual physical, sure. it's a reasonable thing. Now, the, the groups that were considered for statin was based on a 10-year risk, correct? Right. It was a 7.5%. So, right, a over 7.5%. Okay. So just to, to, I know we have limited time, but I'll just say briefly, um, how intense a statin should be chosen based on these things. So those, of those four groups that I mentioned, the patients who have an LDL over 190 or the secondary prevention patients are supposed to get intense statins. And the patients who are, have a high risk but haven't yet have a heart attack or stroke, a risk over 7.5%, or diabetes with a, a, a risk over 7.5%, are supposed to get a moderate intensity statin. And what's different is we're no longer treating to a goal. We're not right. saying we're trying to get you a goal. We're just supposed to give you this cholesterol medicine and say go away, which is going to be very different and hard for us to get used to, at least for me initially, uh, for this. Was there talk about a goal of a percentage drop, though? Well, the, the, the thing is, is that they've chosen for their list high-intensity statins are the Lipitor or the Crestor at the highest doses, and those lower cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, by about 50%. So they're saying we should just give those, those medicines to those patients, and that's what they should stay on. And the moderate intensity statins are the lower doses of Lipitor and Crestor, and then also the Simvastatin and Pravastatin. So in my mind, you know, I have a lot of issues here that I'm certainly still digesting to try to make sense of. I'm a little bit uncomfortable because, you know, we know that some patients, as you said, it's an average, right? So some people we see 
with those strong statins lower by only 10 or 20%, but some will reduce by 70%. So do you just leave people on this? I'm a little uncomfortable with that, and it doesn't do what we're trying to do with most areas of medicine and personalize the care. They're just gonna give the drug and say, good luck to you. Not gonna say, Let, let's try to choose the best medicine that if you don't need this much, we'll give you less. If you need more, we'll give you more. I have some issues with this as a concern. I mean, just as an aside, as a practical matter too, you know, let's say you have this patient in whom it's recommended they go on either Lipitor or Crestor, but as it stands right now, many of the insurance companies don't let you do that from a cost standpoint. Right. They will make you go to some of the small, you know, the weaker ones sure. first, and, and so that's another dilemma. I think that uh, that's a, that, I think that will be corrected pretty quickly. Yeah. Another one in the insurance realm is you know you and I know that we are actually graded by our insurance companies on whether we achieve the LDL goal of a hundred. Right. And now this is not recommending that. If your patient's on Cresto, you're doing the right thing. If your patient's on Lipitor, you're doing the right thing. Nothing else needs to be done. So these things will have to be worked out through the system. Yeah. I know we're running short on time, but I'll just say that one other thing I will mention is they said that if you do have intermediate risk, there are four things that you could consider. And the four things that they recommend that you consider is a family history, and they define that as a first degree relative. So that's your parents, your siblings, or your children. And if, the, if a male relative had a heart attack or stroke before 55, or a female relative had a heart attack or stroke <coughs> before 65, that would be considered a family history, and that could help sway your decision. It's not clear to me how, you know, what qualifies for that. You know, is it 5%, is 6%? It what qualifies as intermediate risk? A second criteria is this blood test called C-reactive protein, so if that number is over two, you could use that. A third thing is a CAT scan for calcium score. The calcium gets collected around the arteries of the heart, and you can come up with a calcium score. And the fourth thing is the ankle brachial index, a, blood, a, a test of the circulation of the legs. But they held one of those in the greatest um, esteem. They said the calcium score was the best thing to do if you had to do something. So you and I aren't doing that. We have the technology at our building right here in, in Haverhill. We could do that. Uh, part of it has been an issue with cost because it's not covered. But I wonder whether that's something now that the guidelines have recommended that we should do it more frequently. Hmm. So I'll just say in summary, we now have some, some different ways to think about it. We have a new calculator, and we have this high intensity and, and medium intensity statin strategy for patients who need statins, and we're no longer using a goal to treatment. Is that the right thing to do or not? A lot of thinking about it. Give me your, wrap this up for us and tell me what your thoughts after I've gone through this. Um, I don't think I can just give you my thoughts in two seconds here, other than, you know, we're wrapping up obviously, but uh, it's very exciting to have some new update, but it seems like there's going to be a lot of questions still remaining, which is, I guess, to be expected with such a And thing. good. Yeah, right. And, um, and uh, you know, I want to just dive into this a little bit more, certainly, but um, it's going to be an interesting time as we shift the way we treat people and what our goals are. And, we, you know, you spend all this time over the years educating the public to something, and now tear that down and start over again. It's going to be an interesting process. It um, is. So, uh, so with that, we are, we are up against the clock, as they say, and we're running out of time. So uh, I want to thank the viewers for joining us for another episode of Matters of the Heart. It was brought to you by Haverhill Community Television as well as Pentucket Medical Cardiology. Thank you. So one of the things, you know, the, the, 